Thanks, Daniel. So my name's Alan McGuire. I'm here to talk about evolving the BPF type format. So BPF type format, um, it's a compact description of types, functions, variables. It's embedded in the kernel and modules. Um, it's in most distributions these days, which is great. And for modern BPF, it really has become central and, and vital for modern tracing, F entry, F exit, compile ones run everywhere, struct ops, K funks. Um, I probably don't need to describe what all those things are to, to, to this audience, but it, it's really become vital for most of the modern BPF functionality. But a pleasing development is we've also seen it being adopted by other um, subsystems as well. So F trace, um, Masami has done some work there, um, which provide uses BTF to give argument types and return values to give more informative tracing output, which, which is a great development. Um, there's a huge potential for debuggers too. Um, because this information is always available, you don't have to go through that extra step of downloading a big dwarf package. Um, the dwarf information is, is huge, whereas the BTF for the kernel is pretty small, around eight megabytes. So, you know, it, it, having it av always available is a huge win. Um, actually, my colleague Stephen Brennan is talking about this in the debugging microconference. He's going to talk about the concept of dwarfless debugging, that having this information close to hand gives you almost everything you need in, in, in kernel debugging um, and having it right there is great. If you look at um, the eBPF summit, uh, Brendan Gregg gave a great talk there called Fast by Friday. And one aspect of that is it, essentially the talk centered on the idea of being able to fix performance issues within you know the five day week. And one aspect of that was having debug information available. So having BTF there in the kernel already embedded um, is a huge win from that perspective. So once BTF is there, all sorts of solutions and, 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 and things become possible. Um, so really what we should really be doing is making sure that BTF is available first of all. So if folks pipe up and, and, and find issues which hamper BTF availability, we should really try and make, make, make best effort to resolve them. Um, and once BTF is there and folks have it, we should make sure that it's solving the problems they want to solve and that they care about. And then finally, um, and these are all in order of priority. So, um, Finally, we want to make it easy to evolve the BPF type format as we find new use cases for it. Um, and undergirding all of these solutions, we really want to make sure we avoid breaking existing tools where possible. We don't want to cause pain for users. Um, and we want to minimize things like need to coordinate between versions of tools and the kernel and so forth. So we really want to make, we want to evolve things while keeping um, compatibility where possible. So the first issue um, we've come across, and it's come up a couple of times on, on, on the BPF discussion list, is that the VM Linux BTF is currently embedded in the VM Linux image, um, and it's too it, it sometimes bloats that image such that it can't be used for embedded systems. So this blocks their use of BTF. So basically, VM Linux with that BTF section of eight megabytes or so forth um, becomes big enough that it, it becomes a problem for these type of systems. So the solution we've talked about here is to support moving that BTF out from that core VM Linux into a module. Um, so the BTF section is delivered via a module. And the reason this helps for the embedded situation is that modules tend to be delivered on a separate partition. So the size constraints that apply to VM Linux itself don't apply to the module. So the idea would be to go from config debug info BTF equals Y to config debug info BTF equals M and be, uh, deliver it via that module. Now, the key thing is, again, you know, to not break things, we want to make sure everything works the same as before. So we have a sysfs representation of btf it appears in sys kernel btf so when a module is loaded the btf representation appears there the vm linux one should still continue to appear at vm linux and what will happen then is no no tooling will break um, because it all accesses that vm linux image from there that vm linux btf from there so the idea is move it to a module but everything else stays the same um so that's the suggested solution for that so i might just pause there quickly because i want to make sure you know i need to allow the room in and to make sure people want uh, to give comments or feedback they can. Okay. So Lorenz is asking how the module will get loaded um, via libbpf or some auto magic. That's, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I haven't really thought that aspect of it through. I've roughly prototyped this, um, but yeah, I mean, we would ideally would do it on demand so the first user of vm linux would would trigger the loading of the module so essentially the experience would be the same for users it just happens that that btf arrives via a module instead so the next issue isn't an issue around overall a btf adoption 
um, it's more around people who are building um, modules and want to include BTF with them. So if the module is built less frequently than the underlying kernel, um, what can often happen is we end up with invalidated BTF. So if I move to the next slide here, what we can see is we have we have this split BTF module um, representation. So the module BTF defines only the types that are unique to the module and not shared with the core VM Linux BTF image. So this this is this module this model of split BTF, and this is a great saving in terms of space. But the problem is the VM Linux BTF can change um, for e even due to minor things. And those IDs in that VM Linux will change as a consequence. And thus, any rep any references to those IDs from the module BTF can cause problems. That they, they become invalidated, and the BTF for the module then becomes useless. So this is a big problem because if you're not building your module at the same time as you're building your kernel, um, th th then that module BTF becomes invalidated. So the suggestion here then is to just build standalone module BTF. So we kind of take the hit of more taking more space for the BTF. Um, but the, the nice thing is it's fully self-referential. So there's no invalidation from the underlying VM Linux. So this is just like, this is not in every case, this is just in cases where the module would be built um, out of tree, for example. Um, so by making the standalone, um, the, the BTF standalone, then it's just fully self-referential. So any changes in VM Linux won't invalidate it. Now, the only problem with this is that all the tooling and the kernel as well um, assume that all BTF for modules is split. So, th the, so the VM Linux BTF will use IDs um, up to a certain number, and then the module BTF will start um, at the number subsequent to that. So that we can we can recognize a BTF ID is modular specifically by by the ID being greater than whatever the VM Linux ID is. So obviously, when you have standalone BTF, the mod the IDs are going to start at zero, one, two. Um, so they're going to be they're going to clash with VM Linux ones. Um, and the tooling doesn't know about this concept of standalone BTF. So the solution is when the module loads, we can remap those IDs for the module. So instead of going from 0, 1, 2 in the way the standalone ones do, we remap them to start beyond the VM Linux IDs in the same way as split BTF would. And the value of doing this is that the tooling can stay the same, the kernel can stay the same. And um, that renumbering is pretty trivial as well. It's just basically adding whatever the last VM Linux BTF ID plus one is. Um, so it looks exactly like split BTF to tools. It just happens that it's fully self-referential. So there's no references back to the to the VM Linux BTF. So it solves that issue of invalidating um, BTF IDs. So that renumbering will happen when the module is loaded. Um, and that would and that essentially solves the problem with um, with that invalidation. And actually there's a sort of connection between these two solutions. So one of the ideas in this solution is we, we define a BTF base variable in, in, in the K-Build subsystem. So the BTF base in general um, for in-tree modules is going to be VM Linux. So when we're building module BTF, it's done relative to VM Linux. So that's the BTF base in those cases is VM Linux. Um, if we're building, however, if we're building a module specifically for VM Linux BTF, that BTF base can't be VM Linux anymore because it's not there. It's in that VM Linux BTF module. So the BTF base variable would be used for that case. And the BTF base variable can also be used to connote the fact we're not building our BTF relative to VM Linux. We want to build standalone BTF. So you can see there in, in, in the slide, I've, I've kind of described how you'd build a standalone module. So you just have make BTF base equals, and then it's just empty to specify the fact that we're not actually building it relative to VM Linux BTF. So with this sort of solution, then the tools all work the same for split BTF uh, as they do for split BTF. So we can, for a standalone module, you can dump the BTF, you can use it in the same way for tracing. It just happens to be fully self-referential. So I think this solves the problem. Now, the only kind of wrinkle with this is that we have within modules, we also can have a BTF ID section, which is used for kfunks, for example. Um, so in that case, we have to update those IDs because they're generated at the same time as the standalone BTF is. So when that module loads, we have to remap those IDs as well, but that's reasonably straightforward to solve. So that sort of brings us to the end of the actually adoption issues with BTF, which are, are things that make it hard to actually use BTF in the first place. Um, so the next step is to really talk about usability issues. So once you've got BTF, what are the problems we run into? So we can pause here for a minute, just in case anyone wants to come in and uh, provide some feedback.
so moving on to usability issues. So one of the things that happens when you build, oh, sorry, you got some. In terms of, can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Okay. Um, how do you plan to do, like, do you plan to do the same for modules itself or would that be shipped with BTF or like, like regular kernel modules? Oh, no, I mean, no, this is just, about... yeah, so, I mean, this, for entry modules that are built at the same time as the kernel, th there's no issue. Um, this would just be for cases like, let's say if you're, if someone's delivering a module out of tree with a package or something like that. In that case, the problem they run into is that if they build that module against VM Linux BTF, um, the next time that VM Linux changes, that BTF is invalid. So, you know, this this is the real challenge. So this is a giving away giving away for folks who aren't building their module at the exact same time as the the VM Linux kernel is being built, giving them a way to actually provide BTF for things like tracing. So the idea is not to change anything for in tree modules at all. So one problem with having like completely self-contained BTF within the module is that it, it's basically like not integrated with F entry and all that stuff and LSM and like all, all the all the stuff that relies on you know like lists of BTF IDs that are allowed to you know to be called SK Funks and all that stuff. So how how do you go about that? Well, if you think about the way the BTF is generated, even in the standalone case, so let's say your BTF refers to an SK buff or something like that. It, it refers to the SK buff that was in the dwarf information initially in, in that module. So it's referring to it's referring to its representation of things at that time. So the K funks will still work. They just are defined via the SK buff um, definition that's associated with the module itself. I, I think it's a little bit more complicated because we have like lists of special types that you can ref count and all that stuff. And like, if you have your own copy of SK buff in your kernel module BTF, that that will be completely different BTF type for, for the kernel. So you will not be allowed to work with SK buff the same way, I think. So, would we need some kind of compatibility check between the two and then maybe use the same ID based on that compatibility passing or something like that? Well, one way is to do BTF deduplication so that SKBuff is detected as the SKBuff coming from the VM Linux BTF, right? But the alternative that I wanted to kind of propose slash ask if you suggested, what if like for those modules that need to be sort of BTF relocatable, right? Instead of just having complete copy of BTF, you maybe we can have like a separate section where we list like the kind of assumptions that we make about base BTF, right? So like if I'm using SK buff, I'll just record that I expect SK buff to be in VM Linux BTF, and it was BTF ID ten, for example, right? And then during the kernel module load, we can well, Lin uh, kernel will have to kind of find the actual BTF ID and rewrite them. So basically, it's still BT, like uh, split BTF, but just sort of relocatable split BTF. And we can discuss how to make sure you, that, you know, like like the, the, the types, when they change the size, what do we do about that and how do we detect that and all stuff. But, you know, that's, that's details. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we sort of have yeah. a similar problem with the KABI today. Um, you know, when, when you're trying to support a kernel version um, for a couple of years, Often you have to pull changes in from upstream to fix things, and sometimes things can change. But we 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 generally the way most most distros kind of deal with that is that they they say these are the things that shouldn't change. So we kind of have some of these problems today in in, in that context. So that might be something that might inform the discussion. But it's so, it's, it's a great idea. We should definitely think about that. Sorry, go on. So so I think that the the, the duplication is the best way. Uh, you you have to have the, the complete definition for the type as used in the module. And then you will look for this type in the kernel, one that completely matches, or or do core right, if something uh, changes. But you have to have the complete complete definition, not just the size, not just the number of members. It has to be the same type, or for, for you to do the, the just replace the number that is in the the module with the the number that is in the kernel, and then you 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 don't need the anymore the one that is in the the module. 
But I think that's a, a, the duplication at kernel mode load time done by libbpf. The problem is that BTF dedupe algorithm is currently in libbpf, it's user space, it's recursive and all this stuff, including it in the kernel is kind of a stretch. Yeah. That, that's like one reason why we don't consider that as like the very first idea, I think. It's yeah. kind of complicated. Kind of, kind of no one yeah. understands it and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in a way, that's what motivated going this, this route, that trying to put that into the kernel seemed to be a big challenge to me, but yeah. yeah I mean, so I think like some, some sort of, like we can add like a section to BTF X or just have like a separate elf section just for modules, right? Which will be sort of BTF relocations, right? Like it's not core relocation, it's just like pure BTF relocation where you can say, okay, type 10 is named SK buff, and maybe we include, I don't know, size or some hash that will be like type ID agnostic, right? But something to validate that like the at least memory layout is more or less compatible, right? And then like renumbering all the type IDs is trivial. That that's not dedupe, that's like one pass and that's it. So much simpler, yeah. it seems. And I guess the good news to say is when when I've experimented with this, the module BTF ID tends not to be massive, which would, when it's standalone, so that would suggest the amount of extra information we need to retain to sort of maintain that um, relocation shouldn't be massive. So I think that should, that, that sort of approach should be kind of doable, I think. Um, so, yeah, we'll, I think we'll, we'll definitely explore some, some of those approaches. Um, so to move on to usability issues, um, we've had a couple of issues around optimization. So when you build your kernel, um, you often end up with all of these strange suffixes on the, on the ends of functions, um, like this isra.0, construct.0, all these type of things. And the problem is these things weren't represented in BTF, and a lot of the time th this cuts you out of being able to do tracing on a lot of the static functions, um, which, 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 which is obviously a bit of a pain. Um, now, this is sort of solved in a way. So BTF now encodes these... Um, a representation of these uh, optimized functions if you use that BTF gen optimized um, option, which is default now. Um, but one of the problems is that we need to also unambiguously link those um, those representations to the functions that they represent. Because in BTF, we don't use the suffixes because dwarf doesn't either. So we want it to be consistent with that. So we need to know which function in KL sims, which has that suffix, this BTF representation refers to. And this kind of feeds into the next issue um, around BTF usability, which is something that we've, we've run, a, run into. And this is very important in the F entry context. Um, so multiple static functions can have the same name, but can have different function signatures. This is a pain. Currently, we, we just leave out these functions. So a function foo can like have an integer parameter in one, one um, compilation unit, and it could have a pointer one in another. And obviously, if you're doing F entry and you're you're attaching to these and, and making assumptions about the types of, of what you're attaching to, this is a real problem. Um, so I think we generally agree that BTF needs to find some sort of way to encode addresses for functions. Um, we haven't really talked about the mechanisms in a huge depth, so I just wanted to explore that a little bit here. I'm going to suggest a sort of tried and tested approach, which is to just have a simple symbol table um, in BTF. So in the BTF header, we have a separate a new section um, dedicated to recording the symbol table for um, BTF IDs and have an address associated with them. So the table would have a very simple format. It doesn't need all the things a normal symbol table does. It doesn't have to have names or um, scope or anything like that. It would just need to have BTF ID address pairs. Um, so a particular BTF ID could also have multiple um, pairs if, it was, if that fu same function signature was associated with multiple um, sites, which it can be. Um, so th th that just at the bottom of the page here, we can kind of see what it looks like. So multiple BTF IDs, um, multiple instances of the same BTF ID can have different function addresses associated with them. Um, and so the reason I pr propose this is it's sort of a simple tried and tested solution. It's backwards compatible. We can continue to use BTF kind func to represent kinds, variables, to the kind var to represent variables. We just have this extra information in the symbol table. Um, my instinct, I have to test this a bit more, I would su suspect it will simplify deduplication. If we add new kinds um, incorporating symbol addresses, the big problem is that if the address becomes part of the information describing that type, then you can't dedupe them. So the same function signature 
could be shared by multiple functions if but if they have different addresses though those functions won't be deduplicated and that can have a cascading effect on B btf size so having that kind of split between the function description and then the function address i think might be valuable um and when the btf is loaded we can just have a simple represent representation um but of this and just have a simple um, index into that symbol table um, to, to get addresses. Another thing we probably need to think about here as well is that in Linux, we've been trying to make it harder for people to get access to the addresses of functions. Um, so if you look at if you look at proc KL sims without privileges, you just see zeros for addresses. So I think separating out the address information in the BTF representation and then being careful about who can get access to it when it's loaded into the kernel it's probably something we're going to have to think about as well. But this is just a suggested approach to this. I think the main thing we need to do is find a way to have addresses in, in, in BTF. The mechanism, I think, is, is something we need to probably figure out. But this is one suggested approach. So Nick is saying one address per entry. Addresses are big. Make them optionally much shorter. Base relative. Yep, that's a, that's a great idea, actually. Um, that's something we could do. And actually, one of the things you have to worry about as well is that um, one of the, um, there's a config option, which basically means that all the addresses get obfuscated, they get all moved by a certain amount when the kernel is loaded. So we'd need to do that base relative computation anyway, probably, um, to deal with that configuration option. So that, that that's a great idea. So anyway, that's just um, one way we could deal with the address issue. I think we're going to need to grasp the nettle on this in some way, though, because we really want to disambiguate functions to make them all accessible. And there's another issue as well, which the address has come in handy for, um, which is variables. At the moment, we only have per CPU global variables. We really want to have all global variables and actually potentially static kernel variables would, would help as well. Um, Particularly, this would help the debugger use case if we have variables. Sometimes a variable, a global variable, is a jumping off point for a list or something like that. So not having that information limits your ability to, to, to do things in a debugging context. So my colleague Stephen had an RFC proposing to add variables. Um, but one of the things we ran into with them is the same thing we've run into for functions, where we can have um, ambiguous names again. So the same name variable can have different types. It's kind of worse for variables. Sometimes the same name can be you know, refer to a struct or to a pointer in, to the same struct in, in different um, compilation units. So we need to get that ambiguity resolved here too. So this is another case where the symbol table approach might make sense. So again, this is sort of why I suggest a symbol table because it cuts across functions and variables as well. And we don't need to perturb any of the existing um, function or um, variable representations. Um, so Chris is saying that's an important topic for traces. Being able to have type info for variables is a major benefit. Um, so another issue we've run into, and this is actually a, a sort of evolving BTF issue as well, is that BTF at the moment, parsing BTF requires you to know about the various kinds within the BTF. So one of the things that can often happen is you can build BTF with one version of a tool and then try and read it with another version. And if the version you're reading it with is older, it might not know about particular kinds that have been added. So for example, if you add like a the enumerated 64 kind, the older tools don't know about that kind, so they can't parse it. Um, so they so they fall over trying to read that BTF. So this the the suggested solution here is if at encoding time we can also encode information about the BTF types that BTF knows about at, at encoding time. If we can give enough information for parsers to be able to read BTF, then we can sort of solve this problem. So the suggestion is to have a section within BTF with the layout of the kinds. And there's only a couple of things you need to specify for each one. You need to specify after the sort of common BTF type structure, is there additional, is there an additional structure and what size is that structure? And then you also have, you can have optionally multiple structures. So for example, for a structure, you have multiple um, structures for each of the elements within that structure. So in that case, you need to know what size each of those elements are. And if you have those two pieces of information, you can then parse. So if we have that kind layout section, um, even if the tools are older, they can use the kind layout to parse BTF, um, even if they don't know about some of the kinds that have been added. So basically what you're doing is at a, in coding time, you're saying these are the BTF kinds I know about, and then BTF tools can use that to parse the BTF that, that, that you have. And then they can kind of walk past any kinds they don't know about and we can make process progress. So here's an example of BPF, BPF tool being run. So this is um, a separate um, 
format argument um, I've added to BT, BPF tool in, in the in the patch series. So the idea is we we provide a way to dump metadata about BTF. Um, so we we can dump information about the um, the BTF header and then information about the client layout. So we can see here the info size is the size of that singular element following the BTF type. Um, some elements have it, some don't. And then the LM size is the the type the size of the kind of variable number of, of, of elements argument that follows as well. So if you have that information, you can then parse the BTF, even if you don't know about the kinds that are, that are specified. So five minutes remaining. So yeah, so let's let's keep moving. So um, one of the problems you have as well is when you're loading module BTF, when you hit that mismatch problem, we don't have a way to explicitly detect that. So what essentially happens is with your module BTF, if one of the references to the underlying VM Linux BTF is wrong, then you know the, the, the parsing fails and then the module BTF can't be used. But we don't have a way to explicitly check the mismatch between module and kernel BTF. So one suggestion was to add CRCs for VM Linux and module BTF. So the idea is when you load a module, um, the module has its own CRC and also the CRC of the object that it was built relative to. So in this case, the module BTF would have a CRC for the VM Linux BTF. Um, and when the module is loaded, it checks that CRC against the one it expects for the for the kernel. So if if basically at loading time, the kernel sees that the module expected a different VM Linux BTF, we can fail up front and not have to deal with the, um, the, the issues of just sort of going along with parsing until we hit a wall. So this provides a way to explicitly um, deal with that problem. So I think that would be a potentially useful approach. Um, then, sorry, we do. Okay, um, so then we move on to issues evolving BTF. So one of the challenges with that, sorry, we, I'm hearing noises from the room. Is that someone asking a question? There was no question or comment. Oh, okay. So just very quickly then, evolving BTF, this is a less of a priority, obviously, um, but we really want to make sure it's possible to add new kinds and so forth without breaking too many things. So BTF generation um, consists of running PA hole with a bunch of options, some of which were opt-in, some of which were opt-out. We wanted to simplify that and also not have to do this thing where we have to check the version of PA hole to see if it's got the options that we want to use at encoding time. So. We, uh, we recently added the BTF features option, which is essentially a simple list of options, opt-in options, um, which you can specify for BTF encoding. Um, if the features don't exist, B B PA hole will ignore ignore the encoding request. And the idea of that is we don't need to check the version of PA hole for particular features. It just makes kind of coordinating between the, the PA hole tool and, and the core kernel a little bit easier. And it also makes it a little bit semantically easier because we're just dealing with a set of opt-in options. And then I've kind of talked about this before. So this is the issue with new BTF clients being added and older tool chains breaking. So in terms of changes, then we end up with some small changes to the BTF header, adding the kind layout information, um, the, um, potentially a symbol table um, and CRCs. Um, so I think that adds up to about 24 bytes. Um, for the kind layout section, we're talking about about 80 bytes for the current number of clients. So four bytes per, for each one. So that gives us that information that allows us to parse um, function addresses, probably about um, half a megabyte um, for the number of um, addresses. But, you know, as Nick suggested, we could maybe look at finding a, a, an offset relative encoding for addresses to, to save a bit of space there. Um, variables add about two megabytes to VM Linux BTF. Um, so there's a little bit of overhead there um, and pretty small overhead to, to modules. And then CRC verification has a computational overhead, but that's only at module load time. So what's done so far is we've done the BTF features. Um, we've done the encoding of optimized functions. Work in progress, I've sent a patch series out, which has the kind layout, CRC verification, and standalone BTF and renumbering. Obviously, we'll need to, we'll need to take a look at that um, and, and see if that's still valid. So to be done is having to BTF it delivered via module and BTF symbol table and BTF variable support. So the variable support, I think, should probably come after we figure out what we want to do about encoding of, of addresses because we have that disambiguation problem that I referred to earlier. So hopefully we can make life a little bit easier for people who want to adopt BTF that are currently blocked, people who want to use BTF for specific use cases, either in the BPF context or elsewhere, like F-Trace and debuggers. And hopefully we can make it easier to evolve BTF for new features. But because these things involve UAPI changes, we really want to do them in a coordinated manner. So trying to find synergies between these solutions, I think, is a useful exercise. So this is why I wanted to kind of lay out 
some of these ideas and see if there's connections between between them all. So thanks for your time. That's me done. So questions, comments, be greatly appreciated. Thank you. So one, one question, like you didn't mention, I don't know if you consider that, like we should probably specify the sorting as well. Order. So like for symbol table, we should decide whether it's sorted by name or sorted by address, but it has to be sorted like just to make the tooling faster by default, right? Like without having, having to resort and all that stuff. That's, that's one of the problems with like elf symbol tables, like random order. Maybe we can even do like a both orders basically. Like in one order, it will be like have the elf, uh, have the symbols listed and in other order, it will be just like the index of the entry that would be at this, uh, you know, like order, like alternative ordering, like we can we can discuss it on the mailing list. But basically, what I was just going to say is that like probably sorting should be part of kind of the standard. Yeah, exactly. Actually, I think in this particular case, I think sorting by BTF IDs might make sense because then you'd have very close together all of the all of the addresses of that that match a particular function signature. So in that case, that's probably a useful order to have. So I guess, but I think ultimately what should dictate it is the use cases. So. You know, we want to sort to be most. We want to sort things to be most effective for whatever ways they're being used. So, if you're doing things by function signature, that would make sense. But you know, you may be doing things in different ways too. So, I guess we just need to we need to think that stuff through. Absolutely. Alan, <clears throat> Alan thank you very much for uh, your presentation and thank you for working on these challenging problems. You are uh, well pretty much single-handedly working and trying to address all of these BTF issues. They're definitely tough, as your presentation demonstrated. So we should, like, this is not the end of the discussion. It's the beginning. We will continue discussing all of these ideas. And even, so, like, one quick comment here regarding the CRCs. So Andre's idea about adding the hash potentially to types. So the reason we are thinking to add this base CRC and the BTF CRC is to, like, avoid this... Uh, uh, validation issues like that are hard to debug when the BTF like mismatch when the kernel module BTF is built uh, later. So maybe actually only instead of like doing the CRCs for this like extra validation step, we will just go and add CRC to all the types that were deduplicated. And then instead of like running the whole dedupe in the kernel, we'll just like match the CRC and that will be like the last this relocation slash adjustment based on the CRC. So instead of like preventing, instead of using the CRC to prevent mismatches, let's actually try to solve it like completely. And maybe CRC will be the answer, like some sort of a hash per type. Not necessarily for yeah. all the types, but for types that were deduplicated. Because the duplication, uh, the standalone stuff uh, makes sense, but um, we cannot just load it because, for example, the module would be built with escape buff that uh, built with the bug mode. It will have a completely different layout. And the module might like assume in like different everything. And the last step of uh, core relocation will just not be correct. So we cannot just split it and assume it's there. Like it, the tooling will, tooling will work, uh, but it not necessarily will be safe. So this dedupe like the combination of Combining the BTF, even though it was standalone, I think it's like necessary. Yeah. So this is just like something for us to address on the mailing list. Yep. Absolutely. Thanks.